organization of this really wonderful event. Good afternoon. Uh, the topic of the lecture is understanding the base of graph convolution and neural networks via intuitive mesh filtering approach prepared by me and colleague Daniel Mandic. The <coughs> idea in this uh, lecture is to present the basics of neural networks and convolution and neural networks through a match filtering approach, maybe a little bit different view, and to explain all the basic operations in these networks uh, from this point of view. So the uh, presentation will be a basic one, and uh, I will not present my research results. I will just list some of them at the end uh, of the presentation. So. Uh, Match filtering will be overviewed at the beginning, then uh, uh, convolution neural networks from that uh, framework will be considered next, and then settings in graph neural networks, graph signal processing, uh, forward and backward calculation will be presented later on. I will give just shortly a step-by-step -step an example to show how even the most complex problems can be done by hand, so one step of each of the examples will be calculated by hand. Work on in progress will be just listed at the end. So, convolutional neural networks uh, really uh, appear because we are interested in common and standard neural networks that focus on pixel-wise combination and information. And uh, the idea was to use a local information uh, in order to reduce the calculation and to get features instead of pixel-wise approach to the analysis of the input signals. Uh, characteristic patterns are <coughs> the topic of convolution and neural networks and they are really considered by uh, kernels in these networks. So I will uh, try to explain how net, uh, convolutional neural networks should work uh, based on match filter approach. Uh, match filtering is very common and standard technique in uh, signal processing and communication theory. Match filtering, uh, uh, task of match filtering is that when we have a signal X of N, the the uh, <coughs> goal is to establish does this signal uh, contains a feature, given feature S of N. At certain um, arbitrary position, of course it is as you as usually assume that everything is uh, in within heavy noise environment. So uh, two possibilities are that signal contains a feature and signal does not contain a feature. But maximum of the output is obtained if we apply match filtering and process this signal through a match filtering. Input response of the match filtering is uh, equal to the reverse version of the signal that we are looking for or the feature that we are looking for. So, if you apply match filtering, uh, match filter to the input signal, <coughs> we will get uh, convolution with the reverse version of the feature and maximum value of the output signal would be equal to the energy of the feature we are looking for. So, to illustrate this one, let us consider, for example, a rather like example, when we have a <coughs> linear chirp signal in continuous and discrete form, and two cases, when this linear chirp signal is present in the input signal, and when this signal is not present in the input signal. Of course, it's very difficult to conclude based on the time form of the signal. Does the signal exist in either of these two signals? That would be uh, also difficult if you do Fourier transform because church signal has spread Fourier transform, so feature uh, uh, situation will be very similar if you do Fourier transform for this signal. If you apply match filtering on these two signals and process these signals through a reverse form of the feature uh, that we are looking for, then in the first case, we will see that there is a big maximum uh, showing that feature is present because it is very, 
well above the assumed threshold, why in the second case there is no maximum, so we cannot say that the feature is present. So easily we give answer to the question, is a given feature present in the signal? So let us connect that with neural network convolution layer. Convolutional layer in net neural network is defined by this equation. And that is obviously not convolution, because convolution is defined in this way. So it is called convolutional layer, although it does not perform convolution operation. It performs match filtering operation. So convolutional layer in uh, convolution neural networks is really doing match filtering operation because we can easily show that this relation which is applied to the standard convolution neural networks is obtained from the match filtering relation because signal input signal is convolved with the reverse version of the kernel and with simple modifications we get the form which is used in standard neural network. So neural network is really doing match filtering not straight convolution with kernels. Why that is important? If a convolution is done and we have two features in a signal and we convolve it with one, for example, feature, we would get something, output will be a signal and we cannot make any conclusion about the presence or not presence of the, that feature. That would be the same if we convolve the input signal with this kind of kernel no conclusion can be made. But if we convolve the input signal in match filtering approach, then easily we see that the second feature is present because kernel is a, a match to the second feature, match filtering shows the result that second feature is present in the input signal. The same is for the first signal if we apply match filtering to the input signal and the kernel is adjusted to the that green feature. So that is comparison. Or if we do convolution, we would not get any indication about the feature. And if we do match filtering, what is really done in convolution and neural networks, then we get an obvious information that feature is present and which feature is present. So if you know that convolution and neural network uh, performs match filtering operation, now we can easily explain several of co most common operations in convolutional neural networks. Uh, that is the case for multiple, multiple, uh, uh, multiple uh, features. I just explained this one before, I, before going to the operations. If we have more than one feature that we are looking for and we want to detect which feature exists in, and if that any one of them exists, we should make a set of features, exactly what has been done in convolution neural network, and then we should find the output for the given input with each of the kernels from the set, detecting the maxima we would give an answer which of these features existed in the input signal. So to be a little bit closer to the explanation of neural networks, convolution neural networks, consider now two features, very simplified, cats and dogs. <laughs> uh, in uh, one dimension with very small number of samples because I want to work by hand on this example. Today. So we have possibility that input signal is of this form, or this form. This is a shifted noisy version of this green form or shifted noisy version of this form. So we provide the input these two signals and we want to tell which of these two features existed in the input signal. So once we do match filtering with first kernel, Second, we do match filtering with second kernel. In both cases, we do match filtering with both kernels because convolution neural network does uh, filtering with all kernels available. And then, in the first case, we get the output signal. 
for the first uh, signal and first feature, first signal and second feature, first signal <coughs> uh, and second feature, second signal and second feature. So easily we see that first signal contains first feature and the second signal contains second feature. That is easily obtained from the uh, match filtering output. So, now we can explain some operations because we see that for match filtering we are really... How do you determine the threshold? Uh, threshold, uh, for this one we should look so just for maximum and for example for neural network would be sufficient to consider difference between maxima. So that's why the fully connected layer would be added. But in signal processing, the threshold would be obtained based on the estimation of the noise added. So, for example, two variances of noise would be enough to get threshold with 95%. But for neural network, the, we usually want to decide which one is present. So we just compare these two, just comparison. And we say, yeah, this is present. Here, we just compare maxima of these two. Since we are comparing maxima, then we can easily justify rectified linear unit uh, operation because output of match filtering is the energy. It should be maximum if the signal exists, uh, uh, if the corresponding signal exists. So just taking away negative values does not mean anything. We are looking just for maxima in this situation. We are looking just for these values. So taking out negative values just simplifies the whole network because we don't care about that nodes anymore, any further. So in neural network <coughs> science, we can easily apply nonlinear function and remove all negative values because we are not interested in them if we consider neural network, convolution neural network as a match filter. So we simplified very much further calculations because all that vertexes are set to zero. And we do not lose anything from that two cases. <coughs> we do not lose any information because the information is contained in the maxima. Doesn't matter which position is of the maxima or its value. So <coughs> that is justification of why we should use uh, non-linear function because we are not interested in negative values. They do not give information. Information is just in the maximum, pos maximum position. So max pooling easily follows. Why to use all samples? Because we are looking for maxima for kernel. So if we are looking for maxima, for maximum, then we can really m do max pooling operation and remove neighboring samples. We don't need them. So we further can simplify all calculation in convolution <coughs> neural network. So max pooling is done, for example, in this case on 10 samples, 10 neighboring samples are connected, maximum value is taken. Of course, we will not lose maximum value we are interested in. We are keeping that value in this case, in this case, but in this specific example, we have 10 times less samples to go further. To, to build a, a fully connected neural network. So from match filtering perspective, finding maxima really justifies max pooling, justifies nonlinear operation. They, are, uh, they follow naturally from that framework. Why then? Uh, <coughs> this is just a zoom in uh, version of this max pooling operation and why we should do that, and we will not lose any information by doing max pooling in convolutional neural network. So that is justification of that operation. Why average pooling is not used? Okay. Can you explain why you don't lose any information while you still throw away samples? All information here is present. Is this signal here, is cat here, or dog is here, or not here? 
There is no any information in all the samples. Only this sample is information. Cat is there. Signal is there. Information for solving the uh, For solving the classification problem. And neural networks are usually applied for classification problems. Even that uh, topic that this morning we discussed, uh, gun networks are really just convolutional networks, classification problem at the end, and just adjusting the, the uh, coefficient. So we are not losing any information, giving away the samples. As far as we keep the maximum, we should not lose the maximum. That is the only information here. So, max pooling, but average pooling does not keep maximum. So it's very rarely used in uh, convolutional neural networks because it can destroy maximum. So, because we see if we do average pooling, means we calculate average of 10 samples and use average pooling, then we are not sure that we will not lose information about maximum. So average pooling, for example, is rarely used. Just to show that match filtering approach can explain more why something is used, why something is not used. So average pooling is rarely used because it can destroy maximum, which is of great importance, which is of essential importance for the detection for classification pro problem. Now, one also interesting, maybe not often present uh, feature, that uh, standard neural networks are really special case of convolutional neural networks. If kernel is of the size of the input signal, then we are looking for the feature of the size of input signal, and convolutional neural network reduces to the standard ne uh, neural network because each sample is connected to one of them. So I will show that graphically, that result. For example, this is signal with eight samples. This is output with four kernels of convolutional neural network with three samples in each kernel. This is with five samples in each kernel, with seven samples, with eight samples in each kernel means that kernel is of the same size like input signal. What does it mean then? That each input signal is connected to each output that is a standard neural network. That is. So it follows as a special case of convolutional neural network if we use features which are very wide, which we usually, what we usually don't do, <laughs> except in the fully connected layer. But it is interesting that we can go and connect these two. In convolutional neural networks, for example, in this case, there are only three parameters, only three parameters for each kernel. <clears throat> then four channels, four times three, there are 12 parameters. Here, if you do fully connected, what is uh, convolutional with the size of the kernel equal to the signal, then there are n weights for each out. So that is n squared then comes if we, or number of channels times n, so output. Yes. It's just, I was just wondering, uh, is there an issue with robustness of, uh, is there an issue with robustness? Because you have to select your template, right? Your no, 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 for, so the be, uh, for the beginning, I'm just going to explain uh, that neural network should be considered as a, a kind of match filtering and it should adjust its coefficients to match filtering. I don't do that. I'm just explaining that it should be done in that way if it follows theory. It yeah. is a nice interpretation. No yes, doubt. interpretation no just. No well, we are working on that one to set coefficients at the input so that they converge fast toward the... the Let's not forget that the match filter is good if it's Gaussian, the additive noise. Ah, yes, Gaussian. Gaussian, so. it is derived for us the best one for the Gaussian input. Yeah. Yeah. Good, thank you. So, <clears throat> this is a simple network just to show, to connect all that signal, kernels, 
max pooling, uh, nonlinear function, and then usually we have few fully connected layers, meaning few full convolutional neural networks with the full size. I'm not. So that would be each line is one coefficient convolution neural network, neural network, fully connected, how it works. <coughs> and now, a few more other operations. Zero padding of the input signal, that is standard operation in signal processing. If we want to keep the same size of the output signal like input signal, then we do zero padding. Stride, down sampling, we should do that if the signal is enough smooth, so there are several values around maxima that we will not lose it. So stride is classical down sampling in signal processing terminology. Multiple convolutions, we usually use more than one layer. So if you use one layer with three samples, if you need to get bigger features, then we use two layers combined into six, uh, into five samples, so we get wider features, or even maybe more complex hyper features, hyper features. So using more layers, it's now more difficult to explain within this framework. Softmax at the end, there are function and the propagation that will be given in this, uh, how it is calculated. Uh, I will be back to the back propagation and match filtering approach in the convolutional graph neural networks because it is more interesting that. What <coughs> I would like always to do an example by hand, even convolutional neural networks could be done by hand. So I checked this example with two features, very simple features, uh, with noise, so that has some realizations, randomly shifted, randomly no random noise added, and the task is to say which feature is present. So detection problem, classical one. So if you do that, it is possible to do everything by hand. Initialize, weights, do, that is forward part, so you have that in presentation, I will not go through, and it is not easy maybe to see even the numbers. Back propagation, and we get new numbers, and after the first one, I let computer work. I did not do more, but it is very interesting to do one iteration by hand before computer does its work. And now it's continued computer in 2000 iteration. I use 200 different uh, realization in 10 epochs, because usually we do not have so many realizations for the training process. So uh, we repeat some of them, because it is highly um, overfitted problem, so we can repeat uh, realizations. And we get this kind of convergence, convergence of fully connected layer coefficients, and that is training, just showing that everything works fine. Now, <coughs> After I just maybe just uh, uh, review shortly classical neural uh, convolution neural network, before going to the graph neural network, I want to redefine standard neural networks within the graph framework. How to define them using graph notation and graph terminology? So. Here we see in standard convolution that we have signal, shifted signal, shifted signal. So what, what is all about, all about is in signal shifting. And then adding to the weighted adding to the original signal to get output. So <coughs> we can do that in matrix form in this way. So this operation in matrix form is like that one. This is agency or connectivity matrix. This is this matrix, and standard time domain can be presented on circular graph if it is periodic or on a line if it is not periodic. So graph uh, shift could be obtained by multiplying the signal with shift matrix A. So in graph terminology, filtering, match filtering, that is one kernel of convolutional neural, neural network, is shifting the signal, multiplying by the coefficients, and adding to the original signal. 
So this adding shifted signal is the aggregate phase, and adding it to the original signal is the update phase. So shifted signals multiply it by coefficients and add to the original signal. Update, aggregate operation in the standard network. The same will be done in graph convolutional network. Only matrix A will change. So if you understand this, how it works in the standard convolutional neural network, and this kind of notation, then nothing changes for graph convolutional networks. The same could be done if the shift is uh, not uh, directed. For undirected shift, we have symmetric uh, change that can also reduce to the standard Fourier analysis. Now we will introduce graph of the domain. So graph of the, the domain for standard signal processing is a circle word graph or a line graph. So we see that all standard networks can be presented and algorithms can be presented as graph one on a circular or line network. Why to use more complex uh, domains than the circular one or the line? Here we present an example of measuring temperature in different points. So if you put that temperatures on a line, there is no any sense to process this signal on a line because these neighboring points are not connected in any way. They are just, just put on the line. Even if you do, uh, uh, if we uh, apply spatial domain, these points are not connected simply according to the distance. Altitude plays big role. Big role plays is it the point on the coast or is it the point on the mountain? So connections are much more complex than just connecting space or just putting a line. So if we connect similar points according to the geographical region, according to the altitude, then we see that each point has its neighboring neighbors. So if we connect for processing each sensing point by the neighbors, then we connect, for example, uh, then we get aggregate written in this form. If we do connection of each sensing point with it, its neighbors, then we get kind of a graph of the domain. So it shows which sensing point each is important and connected with other points and should be used for processing. So here means the point 41 for processing, we should heavily take into account neighboring points, but not take into account other points. So when we collect all that, we get graph of a signal domain. Graph is a domain for processing of the signal. So in the case of graph, we have vertices, that means uh, positions of the sensors, and we have their connections, neighborhoods, showing which sensing points are connected with which point, so that are edges of the graph. Graph vertices, positions, graph edges, showing the importance and connections. And measuring temperature on that kind of sensing structure is a signal on a graph, that means temperatures measured in a vertices and their neighborhood is shown. So now we have much more complex structure for the signal of the domain. I, I will show just a few examples why the graph is more appropriate domain than the standard one. Very simple, again. If you want to process this image, noisy image, and use, for example, regular space domain, then we will do processing over the edges of different objects, what is not good and what will result in smoothing. What we should do? Find a way for now, we will see later how, to disconnect the edges over the uh, connections between 
two points which are on different objects. If we disconnect the lines, we can do processing in this domain, but not going over this because we disconnected that points. And that is graph domain. That is graph domain for signal processing. And if we do just simple low pass filtering, just very simple low pass filtering, we would get this one protecting even this point and almost any other one is a result. So that would be the way how to produce domain. In this case, that would be very simple. We would compare just the signal values and the, the disconnect uh, the graph if signal values different much. Now, a famous black uh, block matching and 3D filtering algorithm can be also very easily interpreted within graph framework. If you define blocks within an image and we find similarity between these blocks, and we connect similar ones and disconnect the similar one. For example, I use here structural similarity index, but any, uh, for example, uh, two-dimensional Fourier transform, uh, discrete cosine Fourier transform can be used uh, with uh, lower coefficients and so on. But here I use just structural similarity index. Then we easily get blocks which are similar and connected. So what we should do shall do in block matching 3D filtering. Just do filtering within similar blocks. So do low pass filtering or for example Wiener filtering what is done in that algorithm and we would get very nicely filtered image. So the data could be not just sensing point, the data could be blocks of uh, images. So here is how to for example analyze connectivity graph obtained using co-activation matrix in brain. So we use the data from internet for co-activation matrix. And then based on that co-activation data, we presented a graph for brain and plotted, for example, highly connected based on the co-activation sensing points, which react in similar way and which are really good for graph signal processing. This is one of standard graphs showing that when data are measured on Swiss roll, then we should take into account three-dimensional structure. We should not connect data or over space where the roll is connected. So graph and a signal, for example, one signal on that graph. Minnesota road graph for data. So for now, I just introduced agency matrix as a connectivity matrix, but it, using that matrix, we ju would just aggregate the samples. Usually, we don't need to aggregate all neighboring samples. We want to normalize them with the number of edges. That's how it comes to the degree matrix. Degree matrix is matrix which is equal to the weights of uh, uh, graphs going to one vertex of the edges going to one vertex, so it does normalization. So if with that matrix, for example, that kind of shift, we do normalized shift, what is usually what we like more than doing shift, uh, that doing just aggregate. Then uh, weights of the graph could be different than just zero and one connected and not connected. We could give weights giving number one to highly connected, close to zero for very low connected values. So we introduce weight matrix instead of binary A matrix that is also very often used. Combination of degree matrix and weight matrix is Laplacian. So that are just matrices that are used to describe graph. They are really can be easily calculated one from another or normalize Laplacian where the weight matrix is uh, normalized by the degree matrix, and that is the most commonly used matrix in the graph uh, convolution of neural networks. So graph is specified by ver uh, vertexes, by edges, a uh, matrix, agency matrix A, or weighting matrix W, which then we can give additionally degree matrix, Laplacian, which is combination of these two graphs could be undirected or directed. 
meaning that matrices are symmetric or not symmetric. So, graph topology, that is now problem. We said, yes, we have graph for the signal domain and we process signal on graph. But the topic is how to define the graph. That is really a challenging problem. So there, I would say there are three major ways to define a graph or the signal domain for signal processing. First one would be geometry of the vertex positions, and that is very often used, for example, for heat transfer uh, problems or problems when we can uh, describe uh, a physical process by diffusion equation. Then we can easily say that uh, relation between values of two different vertexes is inversely proportional to the distance, distance between the two vertexes. So if distance is large, then points are not related. If distance is almost zero, then points are very closely related. So that is one class of the problems where geometry of the vertexes, meaning geometry of the sensing points, can give us idea about the connectivity. The other one is uh, even is more easier, physically well-defined graph. For example, we all learn in undergraduate studies electrical circuits, so the graphs, uh, networks, computer networks, so the graph, power systems, so the graph, uh, and so on. So there are some systems which are already, graph is already there, defined. So we don't have to take care about graph. Graph is the system. So we have just to use that system and to process signal on that. But the most challenging is the third one. So I think there will be lectures tomorrow and day after tomorrow on this, only on this topic. And we have a review paper as well. I will show it later, dealing only with that topic. So that topic is to define the graph based on the data. So we collect the data. Then before processing data, we try to establish how the data are related. That is not easy task. And then to define graph based on the relation of the data. And there are many approaches to, to define the graph based on the data. And then use that graph to process the data. I will not go to the topic. It is really very challenging, very interesting topic. How to define graph based on data. In order to define a system on a graph, what we really want to define match filter or any kind of filter in the graph, we first have to define shift on a graph. Shift on a graph, if we have a signal, neighboring points, then shifted signal on a graph is that one. So we shift the signal value to all of neighboring to all neighboring points. So now we see that is a big difference from the classical signal processing that is usually does not preserve energy property and can be, if we have applied several times, can be unstable and so on. So we have really to take care about the properties of the shift of graph, which is not simple, but it is needed to define a system. This will be a standard shift signal and shift versions and how it works on a graph. For example, this is case with directed graph. Yellow one goes to <coughs> neighboring points. Green one goes to neighboring points based on the definition. And direction is uh, opposite to the direction of the signal, how the signal changes. But not important for now. Uh, now, to define system on a graph. This is standard fear filter. We see that fear filter is defined by signal and its shifted versions. Shifted versions. The same can be done by matrix. And on graph signals, that is the same. But shift is not standard shift, but matrix A times X, of course. Shift on graph can be defined also in many ways. This is not the only definition of shift on graph. 
I will later show you one most recent paper that we just sent. It is going to be published in neural networks. It's just dealing about shift definition, how they define shift on a graph, which will satisfy some properties and provide some advantages, of course. So that is just one possibility, very simple, that I want to show, but it is not the only one. So Laplacian weight matrix could be used as a shift. Laplacian can be used as a shift operator. And here we come to the graph Fourier transform. If, for example, we use Laplacian as a shift, and we do the composition of a Laplacian, since it, it is symmetric matrix, we can do eigenvalue decomposition of that matrix with eigenvectors and eigenvalues within matrices U and lambda. And we have system on a graph written in this way. If we replace Laplacian with its eigenvalue decomposition, we easily get this relation. And this relation indicates how to introduce graph Fourier transform and inverse graph Fourier transform. It is graph Fourier transform is signal multiplied by the eigenvectors matrix, inverse eigenvector matrix, and that is definition of graph Fourier transform. And this is inverse graph Fourier transform. So a way to understand graph Fourier transform could be the composition of a signal on a set of orthonormal vectors. And that vectors are obtained as the vectors of the Laplacian. So, uh, or the decomposition of Laplacian. Of course, instead of Laplacian, we can use any other matrix, like, for example, A matrix, W matrix, and so on. For example, if you use A matrix that was shown before on a circular graph, and do the composition, we would get exactly the Fourier transform. So if we do the composition of agency matrix on circular directed graph that I showed before, eigenvectors are Fourier basis functions. So we get exactly the Fourier analysis. The Fourier analysis follows as a special case of graph Fourier transform on a circular graph directed and undirected. So, this is first eigenvector in classical Fourier transform, second, third, uh, thirtieth, and so on. If we do that the same for this graph, first one, again, is constant value, second, slow varying, and so on, fast varying one. On more complex graph, the first eigenvector, constant vector, slow varying vector, all positive, negative values, we see similarity between Fourier analysis and graph Fourier transform. It can be easily shown that eigenvalue represents the smooth, smoothing index of each eigenvector. Smoothing index shows how fast the, change, uh, the eigenvector changes. If eigenvector does not change, then its eigenvalue is zero. If change is slowly, then eigenvalue is small. If change is fast, eigenvalue is big. Why we need this one? Because in graph signal processing, we don't have frequencies. We have to find something to replace the notion of frequencies, showing how fast signal changes. So eigenvalues here to play the role of kind of showing how fast signal changes, how agent vector is smooth or not. Spectral vectors also are introduced to, to uh, uh, based on agent vectors because we are really customary looking at the agent vectors, for example, Fourier transform vector, Fourier transform basis functions. In this way, for each uh, vertex, there is a <coughs> there is eigen uh, function or basis function that changes over vertices. But if for one vertex we collect the values of eigen vectors, we get spectral vectors associated to vertices. And 
spectral distance between two vertices is then measured as the distance between spectral vectors. Vectors. How spectral vectors are different for two two vec uh, vertices. For example, if you use only two the more significant uh, eigen vectors, then we get reduced spectral distance, or three or so. So, for example, if you do that for the graph from the beginning, we do eigen value decomposition, calculate spectral vectors, eigen vectors, and then spectral vectors, and use three of them, just find distance, we see how the regions in the graph are easily separated and how they can be used for processing. So that is the way how naturally graph was separated like we did in image when we disconnected that, that regions for processing image. Spectral vectors can be easily used for clustering if you find, for example, just one spectral vector called second, called filler vector, and use its values for clustering. So, for example, let's go back and see here. Connect this with negative value, and connect this with positive value, claim that they are in one vertex. We get indication of similarity between images. And connection here for the images was calculated based on similarity index. So here, this kind of clustering of uh, graph is very close to the, to the minimum cut clustering. That is approximation of minimum cut clustering. Another example of classification. And now we are uh, ready to start with uh, graph uh, convolution and neural networks and maybe make a break for a few minutes. So in graph <laughs> convolutional neural networks, only I have not seen that anybody used higher than first order system. Only first order system are used. So just to connect it with the standard neural network, that would mean like we use m is equal to just two samples, sample one and neighboring sample. That would be relation to the uh, classical convolutional. In graph convolutional neural network, only system of the first order signal and its neighboring points are used as a system. So a system can be built, first order system, using Laplacian, normalized Laplacian, or normalized weight matrix. And the last one is commonly used as the only one. So normalized weight matrix is commonly used was the system on a graph. And now that is system on a graph for multi-channel. Of course, we have more channels. We use many of these first-order systems on graph. So we use K first-order systems. And now <coughs> I want to connect it with match filtering. Now back uh, to the match filtering topic. Is this related, could, be, could this be related to match filtering? Do we really look for uh, features in a graph that are of the first order obtained by a signal and its neighboring points? It seems like we are doing that. So, but to show that we <coughs> other first order systems, we have to introduce match filter on a graph. To introduce match filter on a graph, we first have to introduce convolution on a graph. Convolution on a graph is introduced by definition of the inverse graph Fourier transform of the product of the Fourier transform of this function, two functions, and that is convolution on a graph. So, based on a convolution on a graph, we can 
using standard proce procedure and, of course, assuming uh, Gaussian noise, <laughs> uh, derive the mesh filter. It again has very similar form, derivation of mesh filter like standard filter. But what is problem now? Problem now is that this is solution, and now this does not work like in ordinary system. So now we cannot say that match filter is a reversed version of the original signal. It's much more complex. Because that is ordinary filter, just to show that it works. And in ordinary filter, everything is fine, match filter. But in this one, this function is not a shift. This function is just multiplying a vector with a desired, with a looking function we are looking for to produce a other function. That is quite complex. So at the beginning, we say we are stuck. We cannot go forward with this idea of match filtering and to extend it to graphs. Because solution of this problem is not easy. It even is not much meaningful because if we have, for example, just a second order system with two coefficients, each it impulse response is spread over all vertexes. So even if we can find it for large graphs, we cannot calculate, we cannot use that one because graphs, large graphs can have millions of vertices. So we cannot use any approach that uses all vertices vertices, we have to reduce the calculation. But fortunately, if we assume that signal in question, our input signal to the graph, is obtained as a result of, the, of a diffusion process, that it is not a general random noise on a graph, but signal on a graph is obtained as a result of a diffusion process, then we can easily show that match filtering in vertex domain is of the same form. So we can use the same approach, but with the assumption that the signal is obtained by a diffusion process. If we can do that, we can continue at least for demonstration. Of course, I <coughs> would say that this assumption can hold or cannot hold. Depends. So if with that assumption, then we get the same result like in classical signal processing. That graph filter is obtained, has the same form match filter like uh, transfer function of this diffusion process. Of course, still we cannot do that in the vertex domain, in the spectral domain, because no operation should be done in the spectral domain. Because, for example, if you have an image of 228 times 228 pixels, number of vertices is 50,000, one Fourier transform calculation is 10 to 9. So no application of any spectral domain calculation. Spectral domain can be used here only as a description and not for calculations in all real graphs. So we have tried we have to try to go back to the vertex domain. How it is done? It is done in the way that this function is reduced to the second order. What if it is not second order? It will to the first order. What if it is not the first order? Then we can connect several layers and we increase the order. So that is the way how we still catch with the general form of the match filtering. So still we can use first order and consider it as a match filter, use it in cascade, and then we can achieve higher order forms for match filtering. So we can still prove that we can use only the first order system. So if we have a graph, and uh, pulse that are results of diffusion process. Two signals, I showed two signals which are results of diffusion process on a graph, which one which just moves the signal and one which changes the sign of signal and uh, 
uh, initialization vertex is uh, randomly chosen. Of course, we can add noise uh, to make the picture more complex. If we do match filtering for these two signals, applying the vertex domain formula on both of them for two cases, in one case shift is with coefficient 3, in the other case is negative shift with minus 2.5. Again, we get battery on PC. PC should be We see uh, match filtering impulse responses are not applicable, but I just calculated them and did match filtering of this signal with this graph uh, based, uh, based on the first definition. And we get the result showing that uh, convolution of graph convolution uh, with match filter produces energy of the feature we are looking for in both cases. So that is the same results we had before. But implementation is done in the vertex domain, not in the spectral domain as I did, just for example, and for checking the results. So we convolve input signal with different features, two different features. First one says that first feature is present. Second one says that the second feature is present. So again, on this kind of input signals, match filtering, framework works to understand the further steps. How would a convolutional neural network look like for that one? So here would be enough to have two channels, but usually we use much more channels than two. That are two first order systems. We can apply, of course, nonlinear operation and add max, uh, fully connected layer soft max layer and detect which one of that two features existed in the input signal. Other forward propagation in graph convolution and neural networks are the same like in standards, so no need to, to, to talk about them. Just a few words on back projection before I go to example. Back projection, not a standard formula for back projection, but for graph we see that gradient vector, <coughs> gradient coordinates are updated according to the, this formula, which are match filtering formula for the error, delta error and uh, corresponding graph. So there will be no, no update if the error is uh, uh, orthonormal to the shifted version of the graph of the signal. If the input signal shifted version are orthonormal to the delta error in some layer, then this will be zero and there will be no update. So still we see match filtering interpretation. Should we do update of the uh, uh, coefficients or not? Again, I did an example by hand first step and let computer finish. So feature, feature one with plus, feature two with minus, form two features with uh, shifting and with some noise that are uh, target signals, calculations all done by hand, forward, backward, and then let computer do the rest. So we see nice convergence and uh, testing results so showing that all Detected. Here we can do max pooling in graph convolution and neural network, but graph max pooling is here much more complex. So there are, we have to not just to avoid, but to redefine graph if we want to use it in next steps. So I described here one max pooling <coughs> operation where maximum value is uh, used, graph is redefined, new graph is formed, and we can use that graph for the next steps. So if you do max pooling, we see that the number of vertices active to the fully connected layer are reduced, 
and this network is much simpler than the initial network and it produced almost the same result. Few words about work in progress. So one is just we are working on that one vertex semantic class activation mapping uh, in order to interpret graph vision graph neural network. It is based on splitting image to the blocks, or in this original paper it was called patches, then establishing the connection, and then using that connection for processing in graph uh, convolution and neural networks, combining them with uh, uh, fully connected layers from input image we get final uh, features at the last convolutional neural networks. We combine them using uh, class activation mapping, and we see what is the output of combined features for this input when the, the bird is important. We see it looks like a match filtering output, producing maximum where the, uh, the bird was there. But a few more examples. For example, this bird is of interest. So we follow this patch and this patch. In this patch, after iterations, it really shows, produces maximum, showing that that bird is object of interest is in the patch. Here, object of interest is not in the patch. So it goes towards zero. So very similar to the example from the beginning, but much more complex situation, going to maximum value, going to zero value. This, was, this is a paper just uh, sent uh, to define the new shift operators. The idea was to have uh, bounded locally stationary uh, random glass signals and then to define shift operator, which is <coughs> uh, for signals uh, that are independent, uh, random independent signals, will preserve uh, the mean and will be con uh, variance consistent in the case of large number of vertexes. And uh, this process, uh, this uh, shift operator defined in iterative way. It is shown that it is possible to define it, iterative procedure to define it based on the W matrix is like that, and we use it in an example for filtering of the signal and improve the results. Daniel used some tensor data in financial system, where financial system parameters with more dimensions are considered either in classical or in graph domain. So he combined them to show the connectivity between the data. Graph, <coughs> multigraph can be applied to tensor network as well, using tensor signals on the same graph or combining the graph for different dimensions. One of the papers that we did two years ago was to define optimal clustering of portfolios. And this was an example using 100 uh, assets, finding their connectivity and splitting them into uh, clusters and then calculating well, what would be obtained if that strategy was followed on the market? Cuts are standard cuts that I use, so we see the improvement that we obtain. That one. Uh, few papers were working, we were working on underground graph structure, analyzing underground structure analyzing connectivity, maybe what uh, would change by introducing new lines. See all the signal we consider the inbound and outbound passengers in the morning and afternoon. That was an example of London ground and analyzed dynamics in this graph. From our recent work, I 
that is a book, Data Analytics on Graphs, with me and Danilo and a few other authors. And that book is really a collection of three papers. That is one of the uh, machine learning on graphs. That is the third part of the paper. One lecture note earlier published about explaining why the graph domain is so important and how to use it for filtering of signals. Other signals is uh, vertex frequency analysis, which generalizes time frequency analysis on graphs, uh, edited by me and uh, Erwin Sadic. That are the papers uh, interesting for this presentation, basics. This is the last one uh, where matching filter, match filtering in graph convolution neural networks is explained and will appear in IEEE Signal Processing Magazine, part of this presentation, but the, the, the last part related to the graphs, match filtering on the graphs. And this is a three-part paper published uh, 2021 on 530 pages, uh, dealing with first part with data analytics on graphs, graphs as a spectrum of graphs, that was the first part, just graphs, properties of graphs, uh, how to understand graphs, cuts, uh, spectral cuts, somebody asked me about cuts, uh, spectral domain, minimum cut, and so on. The second part is uh, data analytics on graphs, signals on graphs, now we, next signals are introduced on graphs and how to process signals on graph. And the third part is how to learn the graph from the data, how to learn graph and how to apply graphs in machine learning. And that's it. I'm ready to Thank you very much. Professor Stankovic for these inspiring presentations. And now I'm expecting questions from the audience, please. Yeah, thank you for the uh, nice presentation. Uh, so I was wondering still about this uh, match filter interpretation. You said, okay, if it's a diffusion, then then we can, we, we the match filter is exactly the same. So can you explain that in a little bit more detail? It was not okay. really clear to me what okay. you mean then, but because a regular FIR filter is also a diffusion. Or is it like the inverse of an FIR filter then? What you call it? Uh, I'll go back. So uh, here is match filter on graph. So this is uh, a given signal, and this is an uh, impulse response of uh, frequency response of graph match graph filter. In general, that can be anything because here we can have white noise, and that could be a diffusion, but diffusion on uh, all vertices. In general, yes, we can say yeah, that is a diffusion because on all vertices. So. If we try to solve this equation, that we will get impulse response over all vertices. That is really what we don't want. We want to find a way to work locally on the graph. So if we assume that the signal x, which is the input, is a result of a I would say limited diffusion process, because if it is a result of a huge uh, diffusion process, yes, you are right. Everything can be written as a result of diffusion process. But we really assume that it is a result of a limited, and not limited, but as a two, one step <laughs> diffusion process. So then we can apply filter. But just in order, then we can say, yeah, that is match filtering. So we get, I would say here we need a small step diffusion process. Just in order to, to explain that this principle can hold, maybe not for a few, but just for several, I wrote this equation, because connection could be that one. But in any case, we do not assume, for example, on a graph of million vertices, that diffusion process of the is obtained on 100 steps. But, uh, could I also say, why is it not going to the inverse, right? Of, because here I could also have a, an inverse filter, right? That leads to even to a, a peakier result, right? If I could find the inverse of my yes, uh, H, yes, yes, of, of course. 
In the, in the first one I found inverse filter and that is uh, Fourier inverse Fourier transform of that filter is this one, so I did it, calculated that one. But then I a calculation was done on two ways. But the idea is was just to try to work with us. Um, let me go at the beginning uh, of presentation related also to this one. Because also here, when we are looking for features in classical neurons, we're just are trying to find features that are, can be described by few neighboring samples. So that's why that was the idea to go to the fusion with few steps. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I was wondering, my question is for further work, I was wondering if there is some work done on instead of considering graphs that they capture only the relationships between pairs of nodes, considering extending this type of networks to like hypergraphs where we have like instead of an adjacency matrix and adjacency tensor for example or something like that. I don't know if uh, there's some work on, on that. Thank you. Maybe. <coughs> Maybe I can answer. Yeah, that, 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 that's clear. Yeah. Thanks for that question. And the slides about links between tensors and graphs are a prelude to that. So, hypergraphs are very interesting. In fact, we have modeled the London underground metro system as a graph. That's a very, very clearly a diffusion process. And as such, it obeys everything that we've said here. Now, you can even model one underground line as a hyper edge, and then it lends itself to a tensor, tensor analysis. Not everything is very simple because one hops in that setting. So if you live in a big city, you would not travel one stop by, by a metro because it's expensive and you spend a lot of time waiting for the train and so you would walk. So this one neighborhood is maybe not the best way to model such things. So there's several extensions we are working on jointly, and it's coming up soon. Yeah. The problem is there's this un uncharted territory. It's a little bit more difficult to make progress. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Yubisha. I have a question somewhat related to this one. So can you show the uh, Costa Montenegro? Specifically. <laughs> Yeah, it was there, but I, I want to go back to the temperatures. Yes, the temperatures. We have all of this, but the uh, temperatures to the nodes, uh, particular values, for example, temperature. But one can also uh, define the nodes uh, with features where the features include the location, the altitude, and the temperature. In that case, you get this beautiful property of exchangeability of all the nodes. The joint distribution does not depend on the order, and you can do what you want. Have you done any work with this kind of uh, Definition of graphs? No, we, we just uh, have done with fixed uh, uh, vertices and that's all. We um, did with this example, we tested this example by again learning the graph from the data as well. So we did all that played with all this system in all the ways data, processing data, learning the graph from data, but we did not yeah, work with changing positions. So Maybe, maybe we can think about that one. We assume that locations are really uh, close to the real locations of the sensing meteorological points and how to process data if they have some problems in uh, measuring the data. So that was just an, an initial idea, idea to explain the graph. So Actually, the graph evolution. Hmm? For, for graph networks, the graph evolution requires For graph neural networks, the graph convolution requires the data x positions. The graph alone is not enough for otherwise how do you interpret convolution. However, there are other methods that can do both, can work only with adjacency metrics. But they can, they, this, that, 
that we shall present here requires an X, an excellent fusion. But just to talk about the hyperparameters, the other question. There have been people who look, so, like Sergio Barbarossa, for example, who has worked on Simplicio. So basically, it could be possible to define higher order uh, convolutions, like not in 2D, but in 3D or 4D. 3D it should be. That's what they comment on hyper, uh, hypergraphs. Mm -hmm. was relating to, right? Because typically, on a graph, you have standard correlations. So yeah, if I have a vector in one node and a vector in another, I look at the correlation coefficient, it's very high, then I declare there's an edge. Yes. Yeah, but basic. it correlation is not a good way to estimate the I agree. I have uh, advocated uh, Because many it, it accumulates uh, indirect uh, well, the, the only problem is that the main problem is in two flavors. First of all, it does not take care of the mediators. So you may have node 1 connected with node 3, yes. and node 2 connected with node 3, but the 1 and 2 are not connected. Are not connected. So that correlation would give the but precision right. matrix would elevate yes. a little bit and last or Precision matrix is better. Yeah, precision, precision matrix, matrix would elevate. If, if it is not singular, it will work. That's true. That's but true. it is commonly singular, so we have to go the other, the, the other further problem, yeah. The other problem with correlations is that they are symmetric creatures. Yes, so they cannot handle directionality. Exactly. They cannot handle directionality. Exactly. 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 Eh? True. Yes. Um, um, the question is, again, ready to this interpretation, um, that you clearly said that when noise is Gaussian, interpretation is perfectly correct, I would say. Uh, but can you elaborate a little bit more in a case where the noise is not Gaussian, and whether a convolution or a convolution uh, graph network is still the right approach? And if, by the way, you have a model where your feature or the signal you are trying to detect is actually not adding to noise, but is a totally, how can I say, nonlinear transformation from the input to the output. So, what happens? I agree, mesh filtering is theoretically the best uh, only in the case of Gaussian noise or the background, of course, but it's not the case. But all convolutional networks still are using that one. So uh, that's why the idea of this was just to explain the existing uh, formulations within match filtering framework, how it fits in the uh, match filtering. Of course, knowing that it is not ideal for all cases, and how all common operations then can be explained if we look at a match filtering. What it is really. So uh, the question is, of course, uh, uh, what kind of neural network we should use if the background is not uh, exactly. uh, Gaussian. Exactly but is. of course, uh, should we make any assumption about the background or without assumption? How to detect a feature when there is no neural known yes. background, but that still that one. is what beyond, I was trying to beyond. argue this morning, that if you have a probabilistic approach where yes, your, uh, your, your estimation, this exactly, morning, your yes, detection yes. estimation problem is turned into a maximum, a posterior or maximum likelihood estimation problem, then you need to learn the joint statistics. Yes, the, and then to and redefine the, the definition then, of the and network. Then, and then you have the optimal value function and the optimal, let's say, algorithm, and which will call for the design of an appropriate base pair architecture. I would say that convolution always takes place when you have uh, um, PDFs, okay, uh, that show that uh, the how can I say uh, the input-output relation is at the end linear. This is the thing. If you look, look at the Gaussian noise, you have this exponential function for the PDF, and what you want to minimize is yeah, the exponent. But, but for, the exponent. Ex for example, this morning you used the GAN network to recognize that. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And GAN is convolutional neural network. Uh, uh, maybe wait, yes, it yes. is just uh, 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 discriminator is convolution neural network, uh, and the uh, generator is transformer. No, 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 no. I have to, uh, I have to add a bit uh, reiterate on this. 
The problem formulation is uh, totally agnostic of the network or the parametric function that you use. Then the practical engineering implementation is using a standard, let's say, fit for a convolutional yes. network, but not the problem formulation. The problem formulation is optimal. Yeah, yeah, but for that was my, you use that that was my yeah, point. Okay. That was my point. Okay. I, I think that there is a way out. Uh, it seems to me that if uh, you start with the features, the axis, and you apply a nonlinear model, then on this nonlinear map, you can interpret the convolution uh, as a linear operator. So it will be after. And for example, we know if, let's say, you want to go from noise uh, Gaussian to, or uniform to Gaussian or, or whatever, then we know that we can apply a nonlinearity that depends on the characteristic function, and that nonlinearity will be helpful. So it may be that it has wider applicability no, after you take the nonlinear map, which is appropriate. Now, how much you need to know to find the appropriate nonlinear map that is. Yeah, that is and to define that kind question. of connections. Yes. Yeah. I think Interesting for all of us. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Not for me, but for all of us, that is really an interesting question how to redefine really convolution and all that. Therefore, from the standard to, the, to, to take into account more general relations. But I think this kind of thinking may be open that kind of uh, uh, what is the idea of this, this, what we are doing, just to open and to interpret this one and to show what advantages and maybe what are the limitations and what are the problems, because this is just interpretation of the existing systems. But from another point of view, so maybe showing and even causing this kind of discussion and how to change it.